Hello, BookTube. I'm involved in two BookTube events uh, for the month of March. I'm involved with quite a few. I, I do a lot of BookTubing. I watch a lot of BookTubing. I take part from the sidelines in quite a few BookTube events, but I'm involved in two of them that I've been letting down. <laughs> I've been letting death the side down on both March Mystery Madness, a big, venerable BookTube event, where we celebrate murder mysteries in all of their varieties. The theme for 2022 is two by two. You cover that theme merely by reading a mystery in the year that ends in 22. <laughs> but although I have been reading a lot of murder mysteries, uh, I haven't been upkeeping this channel on my progress with March Mystery Madness. So that's, that's terrible. I was going to do two things for March Mystery Madness. I was going to read a lot of mysteries. That part has been happening. I was also going to write a mystery about the Apollo twins. It was going to be a Regency era mystery about uh, identical twin young men who fall upon a country house murder mystery that, and have to solve it. Uh, I plotted that out. I, I outlined all of the characters. I got ready with what I wanted to do. I'm still trying to figure out how to plot murder mysteries. I think it's, the more I think about it, the more I think it has a lot to do with math in a way that I am just inherently not good at. And I, I know, I know, I've read many, many interviews with mystery authors who say they have no idea how this, the story is going to come out when they start the story. Or that the mathematical intricacies of who was where and who had how long to get from A to B is not on their mind. They figure that out later. The, the mystery arises from some other creative impulse. I always get the impression, no offense intended, of course, no names here, but I always get the impression that the mystery authors who say that are talking about second-rate murder mysteries. And the goal of any kind of writing is to write something that's first rate, whether you have a chance of succeeding or not. I, it always strikes me that the, the mystery authors who say to their interviewers, oh yes, I plan everything ahead of time right down to the last detail. This is a, a piece of watch work. Then I add in the character. Then I add in the details about the setting. Then I add in the neat dialogue. I do all that second. The first thing I do is come up with the intricate machinery of the plot. How it happened and also how it's going to seem like it happened until I the pieces start falling together and the big reveal comes in. I work out my red herrings. I work out everything so that that one persnickety reader won't come to me when the book is over and say, but what about this? I work out all those details ahead of time and then I write the fun stuff. It's always seemed to me that the mystery authors who say that sort of thing in an interview are the ones who write better mysteries. So the part of my brain that has been saying, don't sweat the, the machinery of the plot in the Apollo Twins. I'm deciding to call the first book the Apollo Twins. If there's another one, I do like writing about these two, so I might I might star them in other things. But uh, the part of my brain that's been telling me you have to work out the mechanics of the plot for the Apollo Twins exhaustively, who was where, who had access to what, before you start writing the real thing, has been slowing me down a lot. And that's not the only thing. There's another thing that's been slowing me down a lot with the Apollo Twins. I mentioned this already on this channel, which is that right when I was getting work on that for March, I was going to write 40,000 words or so of the Apollo Twins for March. It's not impossible to do. Obviously, if you can do NaNoWriMo, you can do that. Uh, but right when I was getting to work on that, another story came to mind. <laughs> another story just sort of thrust itself upon me. And it isn't a murder mystery at all. It, the closest you could call it would be science fiction. Uh, it, even then, I don't know exactly what to call it, but it came to me fully formed, one of those things that where you you just want the fun of writing it, You where it's, it's so much fun because the work element feels like it's gone. Some part of your brain has already worked out all of the mechanics, and all you have is the fun part of writing it. That actually happened to me. That doesn't happen to me often. The most epic case was my, my novel, Troy War, a novel that I wrote about the Trojan War that actually did feel that way. And in that case, I could understand it because I had been working out the details of that novel for 28 years, reading the Iliad and the Odyssey every year. <laughs> but this thing, this new story, no. Don't know how it happened, but when that happens, good God, the pull to write that thing and write nothing else is so strong. <laughs> it's just so strong when a story so quote unquote wants to be written like that and that happened right at the beginning of mars that happened right when i was putting pen to paper with the apollo twins which has been a great deal of fun I, but 
the Apollo, the Apollo Twins is not stalled. It's not stalled at all. It, it, it keeps wanting to go in a different direction than I want it to go in. I guess what I'm trying to say is that for the writing projects in March, I am not the master of my own domain. <laughs> these things, these things, the, the one, the, the, the uh, two-person science fiction story, if you want to call it that, is constantly pulling me to write it, to just keep writing it. And the Apollo Twins, it's a, it's a Regency era a country house murder mystery. But there's something else that wants to happen in that story. I'm not going to mention it on this channel. Uh, but there's something else that very much wants to happen in that story. And I confess, would be a more interesting story. <laughs> it's just would, it would, it, 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 the, as the interest grew, the niche quality would grow as well. <laughs> so the writing side of of March Mystery Madness has been a mess for me. The other side, the, the other side that I plan for March Mystery Madness, this is kind of an update video on both of these failures. <laughs> the, the other side of what I planned has been going fairly well. I planned on reading as many mainstream American market new release mysteries as I could. Uh, and at the, at the, uh, I'm trying to remember the number. I got it yesterday. But at the, at the time of this filming, I have well over, uh, 230 books read in March. I think the number is around 244. Uh, and a large number of those are murder mysteries. Far more, a, a, a far greater percentage of that number is murder mysteries than, uh, it was last year, for instance. So I, that part is working. The writing part, not so much, but it's working. I am getting the writing done. I, that, that Once you have the discipline in place to just clear your deck and write, that stays. That's sort of ironclad. It, it, when the day starts, no matter what shambles the project might be in, once you've got that discipline in place, you know you are going to get your words done that day. It's just something larger that, that isn't coming to heel with the Apollo Twins. So that part is a little bit unruly. I'm still getting the words written, but it's 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 not it's not clear the way I want it. And the other part of the task I set for myself, the reading of new release murder mysteries, is going well. It's going really well. I'm not doing uh, progress reports on this channel, but that brings me to the major failing of March Mystery Madness, which is that it's a communal booktube event, and I'm letting my host down by not making regular videos. Now March is only. It's only half done, <laughs> so I, there's a, I can redeem myself. I can work in March Mystery Madness updates for the rest of the month. I, of course, would like to know how your March Mystery Madness is going. I'm assuming you're all participating, except maybe Sean the Book Maniac. Uh, I think everybody else loves murder mysteries. I certainly do. Uh, I have to say, <laughs> since, I, since I'm confessing all in this update, I haven't been all that impressed with a lot of the March Mystery releases that I've been reading. Uh I'm not skipping ahead. I'm not reading April or May releases, and I'm not. I've, I covered all the major stuff that I wanted to do for the previous month, so I'm just reading March mysteries, and I'm. Not, I haven't been all that impressed with what I've been reading so far, and that's of a piece with my reading in 2022. Just in general, I realized the other day that that I have read a large number. Well, I don't know the exact number. It's well over 200 books. I, it's it's an amount. The amount over 200 of books that I've read so far in 2022 is the typical year-long tally of many readers. That's the amount extra that I've read on top of that. And I've read widely in a lot of genres, translated work, debut fiction, history, biography, all the usual Steve suspects. And I, I do that because I love the feeling of keeping my nose above water. I love the feeling of, of keeping a toehold on actual accountability for new releases, which is a thing that drives every avid reader crazy, the, 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 you know, too many books, not enough time, that sort of thing. I like the feeling of keeping a toehold on that. It's illusory because I'm only reading a small fraction, even of the murder mysteries that are coming out, even in the month of March. But I, it, it's a, su a serviceable illusion. It feels real. If I look at the new release table at a Barnes & Noble or, you know, whatever... I'm going to see a lot of books that I have read or that I have on my docket to read in the rest of March. That, that, I like that feeling, but that's not, that's not why I do it, right? That, that's that's uh, the remit that I've cut out for myself. But the reason that I read just in general 
It's the same reason that you all read, that we all read just in general, for that feeling, that particular feeling, that book that makes the hair stand up on your skin, that book that utterly consumes you, that makes the whole world fall away, that book that makes you want to run out and hand it to the next person you see, recommend it to everyone. I read for those books. I read for that feeling, right? If reading just in general, if the world, if the Republic of Letters didn't have that feeling, I would take up another profession. I would take up another hobby. I read for that. Uh, and we're halfway through March, and I've had that feeling exactly twice in 2022, with 2022 new releases. Twice. In all that time. That's pretty bad. So... Uh, on, the, on the one hand, I, I would ordinarily say, well, maybe you just aren't reading widely enough. But honestly, who reads more widely than I do? In my own chosen patch, who reads more widely than I do? If, if we're talking critics, nobody does. Nobody even comes close. But even if we're talking book readers, just in general, most of you stick to a smaller palette of genres than I do. Most of you have a lot less time to devote to reading than I do because you're busy making responsible, worthwhile lives. <laughs> uh, no. My first response is, well, maybe you're just not reading widely enough, but that's just Boston Irish Catholic guilt. I think a better response to draw from the lackluster performance that I've had so far is that March is under, that 2022 is underperforming in its new release books. <laughs> How's that, for, how's that for overweening? <laughs> I, I'm having a bad reading experience, so it must be an entire calendar year's fault. Nevertheless, <laughs> there's a strong case to be made. I have read uh, probably 13 or 14 books that were excellent. That were excellent. Where I, I thought, you know, there aren't any major defects here. There's a lot of strength here. I can certainly recommend this. It would be a pleasure to review this, etc., etc. But we're not talking about excellence here, right? When we're talking about the hair going up like that, when we're talking about that galvanic response, that's not just excellence. That's something else. In fact, that doesn't even have to have excellence to support it. Usually it does, I think. But that kind of response is different than just the technical quality of the book. I've read 13 or 14 excellent books in 2022 so far for 240-something books. But of those books, the, the total number of books that I've read, two of them have been that kind of experience, that kind of, oh my God, this is incredible, this is bottomless, this is why I read, I must get everyone in the world to give this a try. Two books. M, Son of the Century, which is a work in translation, and Apple Milano translates, or Anne Milano Apple, uh, translates, Antonio Scarati's historical novel, Am, Son of the Century, which is about uh, the formative years of Benito Mussolini. I don't call them. <laughs> I don't, I would never have predicted that I'd be saying this about a book with that subject, but it's brilliant. Utterly incredible, and her translation really ought to get her a major award. It's the, it's amazing. The, it, the job she does on a line-by-line -line level is amazing. Uh, that's one. And the other is Young Mungo. Uh, by Douglas Stewart, his follow-up to Shuggy Bane, uh, which I thought, you know, it's a doomed love story between two young boys in uh, 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 planned housing in a, a poverty-stricken area in a time and a place where the older brother of one of the young characters is a gang member, gang leader, a brutal figure. Everyone, even the parents, are brutal where it's just a brutal world and two boys cannot possibly fall in love with each other. It just cannot happen. Uh, and they do, and there's heartache. And I thought, okay, well, that's, it's a pretty overtly manipulative premise, but so was the premise for Shuggy Bane and Shuggy Bane definitely works. It, it, it's just a, a grand success. I was thinking, okay, so you're taking the same heavy machinery, manipulative premise but this is your second book, Shuggy Bane read like it took a whole lot out of you, so maybe this won't be good. Maybe this is an unworked draft that you were working on and dropped in order to write Shuggy Bane, or maybe this is something you wrote quickly when you don't seem like the kind of writer who does his best work at speed. In other words, maybe it will be the famous sophomore slump, where the second novel is something the author and the reader would prefer to forget. No, <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. It's incredible. Just incredible. Those two books are incredible. Both fiction. 
One gay fiction, one translated. And nothing else. Nothing else. Not translated works, not history, not biography, not military history, nothing other than those two. So, uh, so uh, and the reason I mention that is because that, it, it, that is reflected in my reading of murder mysteries. I am granted in this month only reading murder mysteries that are new, that are coming out in the U.S. market in March. And so far, <laughs> quite a few of them get a passing grade, but in terms of that experience where you read a murder mystery and it's just so good, just so, so good, no, not so far, not so far. Maybe I'm picking the wrong ones because, again, I'm not covering the whole of this. Even in that one genre for that one month, I couldn't possibly do it. But I'm covering a lot. I'm covering a lot of them, and I'm not encountering that. Even with uh, the latest examples in series that I have liked. Uh, so maybe that's a reason why I haven't been doing uh, check-in progress reports. I Whatever the reason is, I feel like I'm letting down my co-host for March Mystery Madness. So, so I will try to do more check-in videos uh, in the next two weeks and the other event the other event that i'm participating in or allegedly participating in for march is the maybury book club matthew at maybury book club and i have a private little two-person book club where we read something together every month and share with you the results <laughs> and, and we ordinarily check in every week at least but this month has been different to commemorate March Mystery Madness, Matthew and I decided on the madcap plan of reading every Sherlock Holmes short story. Uh, many of which he had never read. All I know, I've read all of them so many times that, that they feel like gospel to me. Uh, but at the beginning of the month, he decided on to take that madcap reading plan and just go nuts with it and make an actual video about every single one of the canonical Arthur Conan Doyle short stories. Uh, and I briefly toyed with the idea of that doing that too, but I make a lot of regular daily videos on this channel as it is. And I thought that might be really, really tedious, but we're both reading from the same volume and I have been doing it. That's the thing. The same thing with March Mystery Madness. I have actually been doing it. I just haven't been making videos. And if, uh, if a tree falls in a forest and you don't make a video about it, does anybody know? Did it really fall? Will it get likes? <laughs> I have been reading Sherlock Holmes short stories and loving it. I've been going through them pretty much one or two a day. Matthew and I worked it out that it would be about two a day that you'd have to do. And I've been doing that. And I've even even for a few days been matching the stories that he did his videos about. And r trying to look at them with fresh eyes. I've noticed a few things. I always notice something new when I'm reading, uh, when I'm reading these stories. One of the things I noticed that uh, isn't new, I've noticed it before, but it's really sticking out for me because I was thinking about them in terms of what someone reading it for the first time would think, uh, was how unfinished a lot of them feel. You think about murder mystery short stories, I mentioned this yesterday, they're really an incredible work of art because they're compressing so much into so small a space. And yet, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle doesn't always seem like he's doing that. I also noticed uh, in a lot of these stories how literary they are. Uh, in in the very first Sherlock Holmes, in the in Doctor Watson's very famous first encounter with Sherlock Holmes, he makes a list of all the things that Holmes doesn't appear to know anything about, including the uh, heliocentric model of the solar system. That uh, Holmes says if it doesn't if it doesn't impinge on solving crimes, then it's taking up extra real estate in the brain. I don't need to know it. Uh, later on, we realize that that obviously isn't true. That that was that that was Holmes having a bit of fun with Watson who he didn't know very well. We get the same thing when Holmes later on elaborates on his brother Mycroft. Uh, it, in the, the first time that, that uh, he tells Watson about Mycroft, he mentions that White Mycroft has a job in the government. It, the second time that Mycroft appears in the story, Holmes says, well, I didn't know you so well then. Just as simple as that. And then elaborates that, that Mycroft is the government, <laughs> that he is some sort of living supercomputer, and that barely any decisions are made by the government without being run through his brain first. And uh, the, same, the same thing I think we are meant to infer is going on with that original list that Watson made up, that Holmes is not just a, a soulless automaton. He actually is extremely well-educated. And uh, it crops up in these stories. All sorts of mentions of uh, all sorts of untranslated 
phrases from French or German, all sorts of uh, mentions of literature from Horace to Hafiz that, that were common, relatively common parlance for the relatively rel well-read Victorian reader of periodical magazines, but a, 20, a 21st century reader will have no idea what they are. And they aren't, of course, explained. They aren't, it, it, they're offhand references. Whether it's them or the Bible or whatever, it's their offhand references that Doyle knew his readers would pick up on, but that readers today, I, I always, when I'm going at these stories, realize how many more of those allusions there are. Uh, but <laughs> I, want, I want to make good on the Mayberry Book Club and March Mystery Madness. So this is an update on both of those and an apology and also a, a promise to do better. I will work update videos into the rest of March so that the whole events of the events aren't a complete loss. So that's, that's my accountability video <laughs> for this. I will, I will wrap this up. Sorry for all the digressions. Uh, and I will leave links to everything appropriate. Uh, and I will see you soon. <laughs> Thank you, Booktube.